Okay, everybody, we've, uh, if you see by your program, we now have a, just a little 15 minute summary, review of the day, and then I'll sit down. Uh, we haven't seen any questions yet. I thought we were all going to. Got them? Might bring them over, Peanut. Let David and let uh, Bishop David and Mary have a look at them. So you have a little cheat. <laughs> have a little cheat before we start. Get your answers before. <laughs> okay. Now, you're all aware that the name of these two days together is the Gospel of John, but under the overall theme of joy made complete. So I thought what I might do uh, in these few moments together is to focus a little bit on the way in which what we have shared to this point plays into that theme of joy made complete by going through uh, what we've shared today, which is a lot. Well, I congratulate you all for nobody hitting the table with your head. <laughs> at a certain stage. If we go back to the beginning of the day, you'll recall that I talked about the uniqueness of this particular gospel, which stands aside from the synoptic tradition, being summed up in the fact that it tells the old story in a new way. Because it's going into a new world. And it's very important for us, even though we can't absolutely identify the contours of that world, it was a world of great insecurity. There's a great scholar, a classic scholar in England who wrote a book just about a, a period a little bit later than this, later in the second century, and he spoke, spoke about this period of the age of anxiety the age of anxiety. Great religious puzzlement. A little bit like our own, as Bishop David said in his intervention. An age of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty. It, it is in that situation where it doesn't, it's not going to help a lot if this story of Jesus is told into this age of, age of anxiety in the way in which it had been told 30, 40 years ago. It has to be told in a new way. In this place of conflicting religious currents, etc. In this place where Gnosticism is just beginning to emerge, where the Greco-Roman religions are beginning to coalesce with the Greek religions falling away and the Roman religions borrowing from them and all. Quite a mess. Quite a mess, and surprisingly, in a world where religion was everything, a very confused world. And into that world, the Gospel of John proclaims freedom, available for them in the person of Jesus Christ, and the joy that will flow from that. In the prologue, we see this already announced. The role of the prologue, right from the start, is to announce, as Mary focused on in her talk on the prologue, that those who receive him become children of God, become children of God. There's a mixed reception. He came unto his own home and his own received him not. But to those who received him, he gave the power to become children of God. The promise that they will become children of God and a story that will follow, as Mary indicated, that shows how they will become children of God. So the Gospel of John, and one of the reasons for its great success, is that it promises joy, hope, love, in a very confused world. And this is one of the reasons why it was so rapidly taken up and, and used. However, the struggle to come to grips with that, to come to grips with this new understanding of a God who has entered our story because he loved us so much that he sent his son not to judge us but to save us. What a word of hope that is to a confused world. God so loved the world that he sent his son not to judge us but to save us. This community has to somehow get beyond their classical categories. 
again a challenge to our own world. I always think those first verses of the Gospel after the prologue where you see the Baptist affirming with confidence this man is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. This is the Son of God right on the very first page of the Gospel of the narrative. This is another message of joy to a confused world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But it's a struggle to get there. And so we saw across those first attempts the first disciples moving away from the Baptist, moving towards Jesus, trying to articulate faith in Jesus, but only getting as far as their culture would let them. You with me? Messiah, Rabbi, King of Israel, uh, the one about whom Moses wrote, all perfectly acceptable Jewish terms. But it's not going to free them in the way that John's Gospel wants them to be free. It's not going to give them that unconditional joy that an understanding of God's love for us, God's saving love for us, can give. And so we then run into the next section of the Gospel, which was the Cana to Cana section, which was this carefully articulated indication to them of these journeys of faith. Now it's very important, and then Mary gave you the example of of, of the Samaritan woman herself, of the, of the, the experience of the, of, of the bridegroom, of the bridegroom as being the center of, of the whole of history, of nourishment that comes from the world, the unification of the north and the south. All of this is being told to them so that they may recognize that a journey of faith is necessary. And as I said to you at the time, this is not about the mother of Jesus. This is not about the royal official. This is not about the Jews, Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, etc., etc. It's about us. It's about the people for whom this gospel was written. Because our joy keeps escaping us because we live in the yo position. Eh? No, yes. Yes. No, no, of course. No is too tough. So is yo. Yes, too tough. So our, nowadays we've got a new language, our default position. <laughs> our default position is yo. This gospel is written, you are slaves in your yo. You are not find joy in your yo. You will find joy by taking this gospel in hand because it has been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you will have life in his name. Life and joy will flow from this text that we are working on over these days. I'll say much more about that tomorrow. In the, in the last chapter, on chapter 20, it's going to say that two of the disciples, Peter and the beloved disciple, as yet did not know the scripture. Well, they couldn't. They were in it. And he's going to say at the end, Blessed are you who have not seen and yet believed, because I've written this book for you. Off you go. You're, you're, you're more blessed than Peter and beloved disciple, because they didn't know the scriptures. You do. We do. Another reason for joy. But the challenge is, and all the time through, through, through John, is this challenge to carry us further, to see in Jesus the perfection of the great promises that God's always made. God has not abandoned his people. God has perfected the gifts of his people, the importance of Mary's translation of chapter 1, which he took from me, by the way. Uh, a gift in place of a gift. A gift in place of a gift. There are two wonderful gifts. There's the gift of Moses, which was word of God. There's the gift of Jesus Christ, who is Word of God. And so we find these two gifts, and we are privileged to live with the second gift. And that's the point of the section on feasts. To let us know that we've lost nothing of God's involvement in human history from the beginning of all time by our commitment to Jesus Christ. This is another reason for joy. We've still got more to do. 
But I'd like to close with just a quick reflection on John 3, verse 8. As a sort of a promise for tomorrow. In John 3, we're talking about Nicodemus and rebirth in the Spirit. And at a certain stage, Jesus tells a little parable, a tiny little parable in which he uses a word, oh, wrong one. That word means wind and it means spirit. Ever heard of a pneumatic tire? Pneuma. So it means wind and it also means spirit. John has a great tendency to use meanings with words with double meanings. In verse 8, he plays upon this meaning. The wind, topnoma, blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes or where it goes. That's true, isn't it? You stand out in the street on a cold, windy day, you know the wind exists, you're standing in it, you feel it, but you don't know where it comes from, you don't know where it goes to, if you work in the weather bureau you might <laughs> but in normal experience we experience the reality of the wind but we do not know of its origin or destiny so it will be with anyone who is born of the spirit change in the meaning of the word spirit those of us who are caught in the reality of the spirit are caught in the mystery of a life that doesn't know its origins or its destiny but we are li living in the spirit and like the wind whose destiny and origin we don't know we are caught in a mystery whose destiny and origin we don't know but this is immediately followed by the information that God so loved the world that he gave his only son not to judge the world but to free it and this is our reason for joy and we'll move on with that tomorrow. Thank you very Thank much. You.